Yeah, I'd fight the Banu. You'd fight the hundred, the hundred Banu sized Tavarin or the hundred Tavarin sized Banu. The hundred Tavarin sized Banu. Yeah. Yeah. Really? I could yeah, probably I talk my way out of that. That's definitely the way to go. Definitely don't want to fight any sized any Tavarin. Why is that? Banu are open to negotiation. Hmm. Tavarin are martial society, so they would, they know how to mess you up. Banu, they just want to and, get along with you. And the Banu are bigger too. So if you took a Tavarin and made them bigger into Banu size, and then had to fight it, oof, that's that's a bad combo. So it's, that seems pretty settled. Settled. Given the choice, you'd rather fight a hundred Banu sized Tavarin than a hundred Tavarin sized Banu. No, Tavarin sized Banu. I, the other way around, yes. So it's better to fight a hundred Tavarin sized Banu because they're nicer. Okay. Yeah, that'd be mine. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to Star Citizen Live, the Alien Week extravaganza. Uh, I'm your host, Jared Huckabee, and we are joined this week by several esteemed members of our narrative team uh, out of our Los Angeles office. We've got Dave Haddock. Say hi, Dave Haddock. I muted. Sorry. Hello. <laughs> we got Adam Weiser. Say hi, Adam. Hello, hello. It only changes once you talk, so I have to wait for you to talk. Uh, we have Sherry. Say hi, Sherry. Hi, Sherry. And we have Jeremy. Hi, say hi, Jeremy. Hello. Oh, it didn't change. Say it again. Hello again. There Waiting you go. Change. Hello. We rely on Zoom to control these things. So. Uh, if you're not familiar with Alien Week, it's that thing that we do every single year where we celebrate the uh, 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 non-human civilizations that are meant to one day populate the Star Citizen universe. Uh, just yesterday, we released uh, a very humorous uh, Alien Week uh, a teaser, um, and I wanted to ask, was that, was that Mike, or, 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 or were you guys involved in that? Uh, that was Mike. That was Mike? Yeah. I mean, we, felt like the that. conversation of like a, a Banu commercial has been floated for a, quite some time, so I think he he finally was able to get it made. But yeah, it was pretty amazing. Yeah, I, I watched. I, I, I saw it. The, I, I saw it the same time everybody else did. When I saw it, I was like, that sounds like Mike to me. Um, so on this week's show, uh, we have collected questions uh, from the community. They put a thread up on Spectrum, and uh, voted up which ones they wanted to see answered most. Uh, we, our narrative team, went through and collected the ones that they were actually suitable to answer. Uh, this is a reminder that even though it was posted as the subject on the thread, this is a uh, Q&A with the narrative team. So asking questions about ship balance or or, 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 or what kind of fighter would be appropriate, you know, so this, it's, not, it's not really the, the team for that. Uh, we're going to jump right in because we do have a, a somewhat abbreviated show. we got to get these people back to their stuff. Uh, one of the first questions we have uh, is about the Tavarn. Um, and it's simply put, how is the Tavarn language guide going? Yeah, good. <clears throat> it's a very abbreviated show today. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, Sherry could, could go... It's a more detail about this one, but uh, yeah, go for it. Yeah, um, we're definitely working on the language uh, it currently. This isn't uh, something that we are like, oh yeah, we're totally doing it. <laughs> no, we're totally doing it. <laughs> but we're gonna make a, a language guide in the style of, um, if anyone's looked at our other language guides, we have the diplomat's guide to Xi'an and we have the rest society guide to Banu. It'll be something like that. Yeah, so let's not let's not bury the lead there. You know, we're, we, uh, every every year we gain new citizens, every promotion, stuff like that. There are people who may have no idea that there are already two alien language guides available now. Yeah, to help you if you if you have that kind of inclination to actually learn uh, the the language themselves, we work with uh, Britton Watkins, who is a incredibly smart and talented uh, xenolinguist, as we call him, uh, who is developing our languages. So uh, one of the things that we do, uh, aside from the fact that we release it in sort of an in-fiction way, uh, the sort of phase that we're at is where we kind of do a lot of like deep dives into the culture because we have to, he has to uh, know a lot of things when building the language of like, you know, is color important to them, uh, you know, do they have a strong sense of self, you know, which might implicate, you know, implicate a direction of how the language is formed. So uh, we we have a weekly uh, what we call a narrative jam where we just it's kind of a, a, a blocked out hour where we can kind of bring the hive mind together and talk over um, 
large scale lore questions, histories. It's meant to be more kind of a social thing, but it's, you know, we can kind of riff about ideas and, and stuff like that. And so we've been kind of working through uh, some of Britain's questions and trying to kind of dive a little bit deeper into a lot of the, the Tavarn culture and stuff like that. It, it, it's interesting. We, and we've had this, some version of this conversation a few times. Uh, we set out to create languages for uh, uh, two of our alien races at that point, uh, the Xi'an and, the, and the, the Banu. And then he comes back with all of these, you know, culture related questions, all of these, you know, society based questions. And by, by our desire to uh, create a language, we end up pushing the very definition of these uh, alien races, the cultures and societies uh, even further just by, by, by answering his questions, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's and it's always going to be one of those interesting things of of you know because we're working with you know the art team as far and the character team as far as like what are these the the physiology of these things look like and, and stuff like that. Like it it helps kind of push conversations forward on other fronts too, which is really cool. Um, but at the same time, we also don't want to because we're having these conversations earlier than some of the other teams are are looking at like you know uh, some of the aliens that. We don't want to hem them in, so we try to again stay cryptic where we can, uh, you know, get answers where we can, but still kind of keep it a little bit loose, so we have the ability to 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 modulate and uh, adjust as we go. So, and I'll I'll just hop in and say that the language docs, even if you don't quite have the time or the inkling to like teach yourself Xi'an uh, over the next uh, you know month or year, they are a great resource just to read if you want to learn more about the culture and that you're saying of a specific species, whether it's their approach to time or gender or work or all these different things are all wrapped into there. So it, it can also be a fun thing just to peruse if you want to learn more about the Banu or the Xi'an in and of themselves. It's a, a very fascinating document. And I know anytime I work on anything related to one of these species, I bring up that doc and I'm just going through it to see how they approach it from a cultural aspect or how they think about things. Um, so it's it's really cool and uh, yeah it's 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 a wonderful re resource and a really really interesting read so mm -hmm. highly recommend it if you have any interest in any of the language or mm -hmm. alien stuff whatsoever. It reminds me of that old uh, Klingon dictionary by Mark Ockrand. You know, the same thing. You know, I had that thing for years and I can't speak Klingon, but a lot of what I know about Klingon lore and stuff comes from reading that dictionary. So. And it's written in UEE -E standard for your convenience. <laughs> so let's give everybody a, a, a primary here, because again, I, I realized I said at the beginning that you know we've always got some new people. There are folks who may not know who our alien races are, so we won't wait, spend too much time on it. But let's just do a Nichols introduction to them. Uh, who wants to tell me about the Xi'an? Jeremy, you want to go? I can do it. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy? Yeah, uh, I, did say, I think it's because our names sound alike when they're said a certain way. Oh. So it's hard to tell who you're talking to sometimes. But um, yes, the Xi'an are a very long lived uh, civilization. They walk around on two legs, they have a very long history. Um, our first contact with the Xi'an was a uh, kind of a public relations disaster and a diplomatic disaster because a terraforming forming company, this is back in the Messer era when everybody doesn't really care about things like rights <laughs> to terraforming planets, moved in and started the terraforming process, but they didn't know that it already had Xi'an on it. So that led to um, a horrific encounter where the Xi'an, you know, naturally not trusting all these people who are shooting lasers at their planet took them hostage. Right, sure. uh, yeah, and that's how the Cold War between humans and aliens started. And the Xi'an was the first of our, our language guides that's available on the robertspaceindustries.com website. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Who wants to take Banu? I'll take Banu. I'll, I'll hop on it. So uh, the Banu were the first uh, alien species that human encountered when uh, one uh, one Banu was trying to basically run from the law in Banu systems and discovered a jump in the Davian system. Um, and uh, just through that first encounter, it kind of set the stage where the Banu are um, 
extremely friendly and first and foremost interested in trade and building connections with with other species uh um so um we have always we've known them the longest we've never had any conflicts with them um they're also a species they they live shorter lifespans we're thinking i think like 30 to 40 years something like that in in comparison uh and their concept of time is interesting where where they kind of like they count up um so it's when they when they start to work they kind of have a clock in their wall that says i'm working to these many beats uh which is also how they they tell tell time is, is through beats essentially um but um yeah they're great they're also um they kind of they're uh they they don't have a written history that they keep around they don't sit down and like like write things to to have to have forever they just they know if something works that's that's the thing that works so it's like if a, a brand new kind of like quantum drive is is designed and it works better than the previous one they stop caring about the the one that came before because this one is better so why do we even need that anymore so this their sense of history is different than ours in that I, in some ways, humanity probably has kept and recorded more Banu history than the Banus have right now, because as long as we've known them, we've kind of kept an eye or kind of kept track of certain things. But for them, they don't care. It's all about kind of living in the moment and uh, and what works good for now. So they're also very, very loud and big fans of Sadaball. So uh, if you go to Sadaball games, they are there and they they love just to cheer in general. They're, they're very I, enthusiastic. I think so. it's just sports in general. We it's yeah. like they just again they don't they don't have team identification they just enjoy the Sports. celebration of the game so they're like like yay you're doing great <laughs> at both sides uh which we've always joked would be is it going to be amazing to see ultimately but like would just be probably really aggravating for most of the other spectators there uh from the banu as a race that we always get along with to another race we always get along with the vandal who wants to take it talk to about talk to us about the vandal uh i could take that one uh so uh yeah so we 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 do not uh know much about the vandal they're basically a very uh clan-based warlike species that was sort of we had uh stumbled upon i guess uh there was a sort of massive expansion uh to sort of one side we call it the western side of the system the ue systems even though there's obviously no directions but uh turns out we had settled on a planet that was kind of a hunting ground for them uh so we uh, a clan came in and, and wiped out uh, a small town, which was our sort of first introduction to them. And uh, they are a very methodical, brutal, uh, cold uh, species. So they just wipe stuff out and they uh, decimate planets. Um, and but they operate they don't have sort of a central core government or anything like that they operate in clans so there's these sort of roaming clans so it makes them very hard to combat because you you knock out one clan doesn't really affect any of the other ones uh they don't talk to each other they don't actually have never made an attempt to kind of establish diplomatic relations with humans so it's been purely violent uh and there have been a lot of clashes with the vandal over the uh centuries i guess and uh to the point where we've had to abandoned systems because they've that had huge pushes into a system uh the ue's tried to hold them and failed and then gotten pushed out so we've lost a handful of systems basically to the to the vandal and it sort of culminated with uh one of our big events which we did back in 2016 which was the sort of attack on uh vega 2 where they basically attacked a uh, ue system and nearly destroyed an entire planet but were managed to be pushed out uh, by Admiral Bishop, which kickstarted a sort of more proactive military campaign uh, to fight their our way back into Vandal space, which is sort of our current conflict on the west side. But yeah, not a lot's known about them. Um, they're obviously very violent, uh, but they also are, seem to be very adaptive. Uh, their physiology is allows them to actually exist uh, in a vacuum for a little bit. Uh, so they're they're very resilient, uh, very smart, uh, and very deadly. I feel like every time we do this, uh, Astropub is just comparing our answers from year to year to year to see what's changed and what's stayed consistent. Uh, Solarize in the Twitch chat wants to know, do vandals poop? It's in the Twitch chat. Uh, I mean, again, as for our unique job description, we have had to have conversations about how each alien poops. Mm-hmm. 
I think we had figured. Adam, do you remember? I feel like we said that they probably had some way of like recycling, recycling their waste, almost like a natural sort of Fremen system, uh, like the bio, the whatever the Fremen suit thing, where it sort of recycles your waste into something like that. But I, I don't actually don't remember. I, I, I don't recall either. But I see Sherry searching furiously, so <laughs> maybe, maybe she'll have an answer in a. In It'll a be fun. Moment while I. On Google searches, uh, but yeah. these are the fun things that we we do have these extensive documents that that we work on just with these questions. And for the Vanduul in general, even though within the game world, um, people don't know much about them, we as a narrative group know a lot about them and 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 these kind of small things. And uh, it's it's fun to 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 know all this stuff and uh, to kind of uh, expand on it and can't wait to until y'all get to to learn more yeah, about Jarsky, it. Jarsky Jarsky S60R says poop was findable in caves already, but that wasn't Dandel poop. That was poop from something else. That was other poop. Yeah. That was other that was other poop. We're we're we're, we're asking Ratadong, specifically a Vandal poop. Yeah, I think Adam's right. There was the uh, Rat Ratadon. Right. Okay. Uh, while Sherry's looking that up, then who wants to tackle Tavarin? Yeah, I guess I'll talk about the Tavarin. Okay. Uh, the Tavarin are a warrior species of aliens and our first kind of uh, enemy in space. And we've been through two wars with them, we being the UE at the time, and the Tavarin uh, you know, ended up losing both and becoming a sort of fractured people now in the midst of a, of a long running, centuries long diaspora. Um, and at the point in time where we are now in the game, they're sort of rediscovering their culture and re-embracing aspects of their culture, finding new places to gather and kind of different political ideologies of how the Tavarin as a species and a culture should continue. Um, yeah, personally, I have, a, I have a soft spot for them. I think they're very cool. Uh, so it's been a lot of fun as we've been developing them more recently. And uh, I hesitate to ask, but anything about the Krithak? Anything uh, to share about not, the nothing, nothing to share. Um, OK. They are a thing. They're basically, to provide context, again, Krithak are basically a um, sort of longstanding mortal enemy of the Xion. Uh, humanity in our universe has not uh, actually experience them have come across them don't know where they are what they are uh but just know that they are they basically exist on the other side of the Xion empire from so there's um uh, humanity Xion, and then kurthak or somewhere over here uh so there's but they basically had a very long war with them that was pretty devastating so uh we know they exist but we don't know anything about them and they won't tell us anything about them and then i guess from the... oh go ahead I would say just from a from what is out there from a lore perspective, there is on the RSI website uh, an article about the end of the the second imperial age of the Xi'an, which does just uh, we don't know too many details, but the Kurthak were basically involved in ending one of the the second imperial line of the Xi'an. So if you have an interest in digging in, that that's kind of the deepest thing that humanity knows uh, so far about uh, about uh, the Krithak and what they're able to do. So that interests you, uh, go go track that down. And also, Jeremy wrote a great uh, a short story called Crossword, Crossroads, specifically about Tavarin bounty hunters that kind of like dig into the the, the topic of the, the Tavarin right now and where they sit in this world. So if that interests you at all, uh, definitely go check that out because it's it's uh, very cool and it really highlights how they're kind of situated in the uh, in the current game world. The, the sequel to which will be Crosswords, though. <laughs> It'll be about them doing puzzles. I found the answer to the very important Vanduul question. <laughs> it's in one of our docs. Um, so when the Vanduul are not fighting or they don't have any like duties going on, they take rests in these heavily in over-engineered pods that just you know replenish their nutrients, give them a better environment to sleep, et cetera, et cetera. And the pods double as a place to eliminate your waste, you know, as often as you need to. There you go. Exclusive. All in one machine. Okay, <laughs> and uh, finally, uh, we have, like I said, we've done this uh, for a few years now. I always forget to ask about the Hadetians. What, what can we share about the, the Hadetians? Uh, 
it is a ancient species that uh, tied to uh, Hades system. So Hades system was is an unclaimed system uh, that uh, is sort of a ar archaeological treasure trove. Uh, it basically it it the aftermath of a basically a, a, a system wide war, a devastating system wide war uh, that resulted in one of the planets actually getting blasted in half uh and there's no indication of who these aliens were what they were fighting over what caused that kind of level of destruction all that stuff so they basically are kind of one of our ancient ancient aliens uh so there's a lot of mystery going on about who who they are so that's our that's our primer introduction to the the, the six principal non-human species that uh people have been made aware of in the Star Citizen universe. Uh, jumping back into the questions from Spectrum, uh, we have a few that are backdoored ship questions, but we'll go ahead and see what we can get for them. Uh, do you feel there is any room in the lore for a newish Tavarin manufacturer in the verse? Uh, yeah, um, I guess we've... I, I think the the easy answer is like there there is space in the lore for it. Like we've uh, with the way the Tavarn are currently going, not only are they starting to have a resurgence within the UEE, uh, uh, the first Tavarn senator Suj Cozy was elected and reelected um, from Elysium, which was the Tavarn's original homeworld. So there, and he's been pushing to get more Tavarns involved in the UE, involved in the government. So whether it could be something like him pushing for subsidies, government subsidies to be, be, be able to support a manufacturer of, you know, kind of like the a new Tavarin kind of like ship line uh, within the UE. Um, there's also a settlement in Brana, which is an unclaimed system. So it's not part of the UE, but a lot of the Tavarin diaspora that maybe didn't quite feel at home in the UEE or just just kind of wanted to start uh, go to a place where their culture was all their own, have started their own kind of like uh, gi giant community there. There's a growing population of Tavarin there. So there's also an angle where we could potentially have some kind of manufacturer come out of the, the Brana system that's basically making more modern Tavarin ships for, for what they need out there. So it's, it's definitely there, though we do have to couch it in saying that what ships get made and what their functions are aren't aren't our choice. We're we're part of that process, but we're normally not the ones that are that are driving that uh, that conversation. But we 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 put in those little areas. So if uh, if a ship like that is is desired or talked about, we can uh, we can support it. Uh, do the Shion have any type of tanks or artillery vehicles comparable to the Nova and the Storm? I mean, I would think that they do. It's a natural part of, a, like, if you have a military, if you have any kind of warfare that you would like to win, you would cover all the fronts you possibly can. And I believe that would include tanks, mobile artillery, that kind of thing. Um, what do the Shion know about our conflict with the Vanduul? And how does the current emperor feel about it? So uh, the Shion, we don't know whether they've had first contact with the Vanduul, but we do know that when humanity had first contact with the Vanduul, it was during um, the Xi'an human cold war. And the opinion of people in the Xi'an empire is like, great, those people that we hate are like distracted. So cool, we're, we're fine with that. I mean, we don't wanna get involved with the Vanduul ourselves or anything, but we like what they're doing, it's fine. Um, uh. <laughs> <laughs> um. I like this question. Uh, for Alien Weekend, we, we see a lot of these alien ships that are retrofitted for human use. Um, uh, is, there, are, uh, is there any lore on different alien species retrofitting, retrofitting human sh ships for their own use? Uh, for example, could any of the more exotic aliens have retrofitted a Polaris or a Hornet or something? Bonu would do it in a second heartbeat. If it works and they have to modify, modify it for Bonnie use, they'd be like, great, done. It's our ship now, Bonnie made. Yeah, and I'm sure you'd see something similar with the Tavarin potentially who, you know, if they were lacking the resources to kind of pursue uh, more traditional designs that were Tavarin originated, I could easily see them wanting to adapt human ships to be more suitable for, for their use. But, you know, those are 
that's just purely in the uh, written lore <laughs> realm and not something that's probably going to somewhere in the game. Yeah. Somewhere there's a Tavarin version of Star Citizen where he, crazy human manufacturers are adapting ships for giant bird people. Uh, are there still t original Tavarin ships or just replicas by Asperia? I mean, I think the, the universe is big enough that you got to imagine there's still ships out there. You know, there's there's metals from like the wars and there's like got to be um, still, you know, collected like replicas or things that have been lost and not found that are out there. Um, yeah. I think it'd be hard to imagine that there's nothing anywhere. And and there was the uh, I mean, it was part of the Cabal system release was that they had found like a, a cache basically of of uh, original um Tavarin ships and weapons and stuff like that. Uh, and that's what they actually, Asperia was given access to in order to be, um, uh, to, to recreate, I think it was the Prowler. Mm. Uh, I'm not sure, but uh, but one of the ships that they, they designed were based off of original scans that they had done of an actual authentic Tavara period. Because the Tavarin has that deal with the UE, like they can't manufacture new stuff after the war. Or my well, I mean, they've been, they were basically assimilated. So they're just part of, you know, the, as a culture, they were assimilated. So, I mean, if it kind of going back to the earlier question about whether there could be a new Tavarin manufacturer, it's certainly possible if a Tavarin decides like, hey, I want to make a new ship, you know, and they've set up a company and they want to build it like they, they're, they're members of the UEE. So technically it would be like any other company. Uh, so. So is this like, is the UE like the Borg here? Are they fully assimilated the Tavarin? Are there places where the Tavarin are completely, totally integrated with humans or? I mean, the hope is that yes, that there's a lot of, that you would just see them, hang, you know, walking down the street and, and you know, that if, if they're living in the UEE and they're part of the, 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 the culture that they're just living in cities and doing their thing. Uh, you know, of course there's like the, like Jeremy and Adam were talking about the diaspora and Brana and stuff like that, where they they are living outside of the UEE but are trying to maintain or rebuild some their uh, their culture. But um, but I mean, again, the hope is that down the road, once we get Tavarin characters in game and stuff like that, that we would just you know we would could modulate basically how much because how many or how few there are based on location. But the idea is that you know you would theoretically could walk around Area 18 and just pass a Tavarin who's getting a, a frosty uh, yeah and i mean they went through like a full civilization collapse essentially after the the second war and so i think you know there's been hundreds of years since then and so there's been time for tavarin to either fall through the cracks and be in the underworld of the human kind of civilization not really in any like kind of registered way or to become more civilized and like you know get representation through suchkasi and all that whether they're you know, officially integrated or part of it doesn't necessarily mean they're enjoying all the same like freedoms or all the same, um, you know, regard, right, in like day-to-day -day life. But I think from the point of view of the UEE, there's ideas that Tavarin also serve in the military and, and all these things. So they, they are, you know, able to be fully integrated in that way, whether they want to be, whether in practice that like translates to a, an equitable day-to-day -day experience, I think is a, is another matter. And then for the the, the, those that want a life outside of that, that's where kind of Brana is, uh, I think, really taking root for the culture. Yeah. And the Tavarin aren't allowed to have their own military or anything, right? Because they're part of the UAE. Yeah, they don't have their own, like, bespoke territory that's allocated to them or anything like that. They would need to, yeah. So, yeah, they're, they're just part of it. They're hmm. part Do, do of the Shion just... have a military? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. They have tanks. Okay. <laughs> Apparently. Yeah. Apparently they we have confirmed a... Xi'an tanks. <laughs> Every Xi'an, once they become a certain age, they have to sign up for the, the civil service, which is run by the uh, emperor's house, the emperor's family. Mm -hmm. They do things depending on where what their talents are and where they've been assigned. Some of them serve their stint in the military. Some of them join bureaucracy or other like important government arms. But like the military is big and everybody essentially serves in it at one point in their life. Well, there's now going to be a dozen uh, uh, Twitch talk shows to uh, speculating about a Xi'an hover tank now after the show. Talk to John Crew, not us. They uh, also have catapults. <laughs> <laughs> 
Anti-gravity catapults. Ooh. Uh, technically, aren't all catapults anti-gravity? <laughs> Makes you think. No, I'm pretty sure they are. <laughs> All right. Um, next question from the Spectrum thread here. The UEE has banned use and development of AI, but have all the other races done the same, or could we someday have alien robots? Um, yeah, I mean, again, like the, 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 the lack of AI or sort of synthetic humans in, in the Star Citizen universe is, is less out of a um why hasn't this technology developed thing i mean we have a reason for that but it's actually a step removed from it it was more of a stylistic choice originally of like not wanting to have like wanting the players to be the ones to be piloting their ship uh you know in early 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 conversations with chris about like what what the kind of game universe would look like f fictionally you know the idea was that you know, he wanted people to get in their ship and fly cargo from one planet to another, not sit there and control a fleet of AI drones that could do it a thousand times better than a human ever could because of their, you know, or fight or whatever, like one of that sort of tactile dogfighting thing. So that's why we, we back created or backfilled all of the, the situations of uh, like the Artemis and there was like the, the traffic incident or whatever that caused a bunch of deaths with AI, AI um, hover vehicles. And to justify why there's no AI in the universe or in the human uh, empire, because they just have been burned by it so many times that they're like, it's just not, it's not worth it to develop it. Screw it. We'll just, you know, make it kind of, uh, you know, computer learning, but not sentient. Uh, so to that point, it feels like we would just extend that to the aliens as well, that maybe they've had bad experiences with it. Maybe it's just never come up. Um, but that way it's just it becomes more of an even playing field because if the Xion have, you know, AI combat drone pilots, like they will just decimate. A, there's no way a human would be able to. I mean, I, you know, I don't know. I saw stealth, so maybe <laughs> humans can overcome it. But uh, uh, but yeah, just that idea that like wanting to have, you know, people in ships flying and battling each other or doing stuff. Uh, so it, it makes sense that the other aliens probably haven't developed it. Uh, just again to make it more of an even playing field across the board would be my answer if you want to see a great conflict between two pilots and an ai you should watch the um <laughs> you should watch macross plus it's a great show <laughs> i better than stealth four episodes long mini series yeah. knock it right out the, those, those directed, are really the, two the directors are... one of the directors directed cowboy bebop just think about that so really the two choices it's macross plus or stealth <laughs> really robotech josh lucas what are you gonna do uh oh you said robotech in front of sherry sherry are you okay i'm all right i'll, I'll get through it uh we have alien cargo ships and alien fighters will we ever see mining salvage or refueling within the alien races I mean, again, I think that's like a, a ship team question, um, but it stands to reason that, you know, these alien civilizations as, as advanced and wide spanning as they are probably have similar needs. How they go about that, I think is a, is a, you know, remains to be determined whether it's utilizing the same technology and the same exact approach as, as we know now with the human manufacturers. Mm -hmm. But so probably, but, you know, again, pending more of a ship team's question if it'll happen at some point soon. Yeah, when 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 folks ask questions like this, you know, the, it, it's it comes from a couple of different places. Part of it comes from they're trying to see if they can reverse engineer you guys leaking something or whatever plan for this ship or that ship. But uh, other times, you, in, in a more honest and noble thing, it's it's about whether there's anything in the lore history of these races that prevents this kind of. Uh, a development for the ship team or something going forward. I mean, is, is there are, is there an alien race of the ones that we know that that we that you would just say no? These people would never develop mining ships, or these people would never develop salvage ships, or or just industrial kind of vehicles of any kind. I I don't know if Xion would ever make party buses, <laughs> but I don't know. Maybe it's a a, a lore jam uh, topic. No, they totally would. Just not a lot. Is she on party bus. 
Breaking if you down. want a party bus, you should probably hit up the Bonner. The, the, I imagine their party buses are the sickest in the universe. Oh yeah. Oh, those would those would be the ones to to be on. Yeah. I just I feel like the based on our conversations with Xi'an music being extremely slow, I feel like a Xi'an party bus would just be like just like this droning uh, thing with like you know decaying food, slow <laughs> paced music, uh, and then extreme meditation. Extreme. Meanwhile, the the Banu, I, I believe the Banu are the ones that take short little naps in like cuddle piles, right? So yeah, they uh, if if you're more looking for that vibe, and they have the the Slobodan, which is a giant kind of like drinking vessel that they do when you you know close a deal with the with the Banu, uh, they they take all this stuff and people put everyone is supposed to bring something uh to add to the slomadon to then drink whether it's the you know the banu stuff or stuff from that so in the banu language guide if you check it out one of the cultural things it, it warns you that if you do if you do it you know do a deal with the banu and, and drink from this to to take it slow bring something light because sometimes the stuff the banu put in is is very very strong so uh yeah banu party bus you know cuddle nap sleeping rooms uh, yeah, they, I think they'd be, they'd be the ones that'd be, uh, yeah, sounds way like, more, way more into it than the Xi'an. Yeah, like I want to see the Origin 600 <laughs> series of the Banu, like what that would look like. <laughs> that, that Banu, Banu would absolutely go to Burning Man. Oh, absolutely. It just sounds like the party drink that we used to take to Ren Fair, where we just empty the liquor cabinet into one giant camel pack. Oh my god. It's a good day. Camelback is never being getting clean after once you get all that stuff in there. Yeah. No, no, no. It's water, honest. Um, given that the Xi'an assign monopolies to companies to produce certain categories of ships, uh, are there any other Xi'an companies besides Apoa or Gatak decided on yet? Yeah, we mostly we mostly uh, make the manufacturers for Xi'an as they're required. So, say the weapons team needs to have really good weapons that are Xi'an made. At that point, we would probably create the house that makes it um, and make up their history and do whatever development needs to be done to show that they would be assigned this particular role. But um, we do have a couple that we named in the Xi'an diplomats guide. Uh, if you look in it near the prestigious family line, we've got, hold on, I forgot the names. 12 family does like fabric and uh, clothing manufacture. They're famous for their particular type of cloth that's like really delicate and semi-transparent, but warm. It's made from mushroom wool, one of the animals that we invented a while back for the uh, alien animal naming contest. How do you, how do you say that? The um, mushroom. Mushroom. It's a four-legged llama thing that makes really nice fur. How did I do with Santokyai? Santokyai. Pretty good. Santokyai. Pra practice. They made fun of me for practicing. I tried. No. Uh, what's the coolest alien sport? That was in the spectrum thread. Do we have? Do, do I not know of any? I don't know of any alien sports. We have. Um, so uh, it, yeah, we've got a few so far. The probably the most apparent one, and I God, I, I don't even know how to pronounce it. Is basically Xi'an endurance racing. Uh, God, Cherry, I'm not sure if you the Kai Cola. It's a Kai Koya. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> we have, we always just assume Sherry's right. Yeah, you know, she could be saying can't whatever. Can't check me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when when we're in the office and she's working on Xi'an stuff, I will I will hear her kind of like doing Xi'an stuff and then actually saying the words out loud and practicing the pitches because it's it's a tonal language. So I know when she's working on it, she's actually putting the thoughts for like the accent means lowering the voice or hiring the voice. So yeah, I, I she's the fantastic resource when I have a question about alien stuff to turn to her and and the be all end all when it comes comes to our team. So. But the, hey, the hey, how do you pronounce this? That's what I'm here for. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> and so much more. But um, yeah, so the the endurance race the Xi'an have is is as we talked about their operas being extremely long and their music being slow and and stuff like that. 
because I, I think it's endothermic, the, the uh, they're able to kind of like slow their heart rate to a certain pace. So the, the Xi'an endurance race is about seeing is a long, long race where the best racers basically are able to kind of like slow their body functions down to a certain point. It's obviously maybe not the most exciting and from a human or, or Banu perspective, but um, it does take a lot of skill, and basically the winners of that in Shia society are are very highly regarded because being able to do this well um, and control your body like that and to meditate while still operating the ship over long distances is very revered. So that's uh, that's one uh, sp sport type thing that we put in. It's a, it's a turtle again, race. Our, yes, yeah, exactly. The band are also, like you said, big fans of sport and Sadaball in general, even though that's not their sport. They're, they love to watch, and yeah, Banu will, uh, are even professional Sadaball players within the UEE because they've, they've taken to the sport so much. There was a Tavarin game. What was the Tavarin game? The Cluey or, Cluey or something. Yeah, uh, Cluey was, it, it's been mentioned in um, a, just a, uh, a few little lore pieces we did, but um, not too much is, it's not too widely known because it was something that was done pre-purge before the Tavarans were defeated in the wars and then basically kind of gave up their, their culture and society. But um, supposedly it was played, it was a team game that was played on stone courses um, and the the belief is that um, basically the team tactics used to kind of navigate the course and win the game were a way to teach younger Tavarin um, basically some of the tactics that uh, would be used when attacking and boarding uh, enemy ships and stuff like that. So uh, it's uh, yeah, that's uh, that that's kind of out there too. And was and there was a wasn't there a card game a Banu card game? Will was workshopping. Uh, yeah, I can't remember the name of it, uh, but yeah, Will it was, was... Uh, Banu Banu. Oh, Banu Banu, that's right. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, he was he was he'd come up with this card game that we played a couple times over lunch, and he was sort of iterating on, uh, which was it was getting to be fun. Like you know, I we should check in with him and see if, see about resurrecting it because yeah, it was a good time. Banu Banu. It was sort of like a liar's game, I think, if I remember correctly. I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> All right. As a follow-up question, also from the thread, a Shion, a Banu, and a Tavarin play a drinking game at a bar citizen. Who is the last one standing? I feel like that's got to be a Shion. I would guess so. I would assume their metabolism is pretty slow. Uh, uh, that being said, I mean, the, uh, the Banu... Eat their own poop. Oh. Professional drinking or, or mixology sulis. Yeah, I would assume so. I mean, I, I guess it's just the, the thing is like if you know they're they'll stay conscious if if it benefits them to stay conscious, so they'll pace themselves or, uh, but hmm. yeah, I don't know. Right. The Xi'an house. Well, I'm not going to attempt to say this. It starts with an N. Nergathak has a monopoly on industry, like mentioned in another reply. But are there how groups or houses in the Xi'an that have a rebellious "I do what I want" attitude, like Drake? Oh, that's interesting. Are there are there alien equivalents of Drake interplanetary? I mean, I don't see why not. The um, Xi'an do assign monopolies in different industries at a really high level. It's only really assigned to like super prestigious houses. Um, it doesn't really do that with smaller houses. And remember that each big house usually has like a hundred or so satellite houses that fall under its umbrella. So any of those little tiny houses might just not want to do whatever industry was assigned to the big house and they would do something else. Um, OA10 Thunderbolt uh, says, so you guys have books or novels in these story lores, or is this all just made up whenever it has to be for a continuity sec? Uh, this is where I want to plug uh, the only a weekly recurring endeavor that's been going on longer than uh, the shows that I make, and that's the weekly lore posts that go out every Tuesday. Who wants to who wants to introduce those to people? Uh, well, they, they're, they're not going out every Tuesday anymore. We've been scaling it. back on it. Uh, they're going out more and more sporadically, but um, uh, yeah. So 
it's we have been trailing off because the needs of of <laughs> Star Citizen and Squadron have uh, sort of over overrode those. Uh, but yes, they went on for over ten years mm -hmm. every week, uh, and they used to be actually three times a week. So was it up to three? Lore. When we first started, uh, I was doing Kid Crimson, uh, Cal Mason, and a news dispatch every week. Uh, so that was fun. Hmm. But yeah, those are all available on the robertspacesyou.com website. Uh, generally speaking, one almost every every week, uh, and they cover a variety of topics. There's, they're in a bunch of different formats. Uh, some take the place of uh, of like talk shows, or take the format of talk shows. Uh, some are more like news reports. Some are just straight. You, you know, like 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 uh, a fiction, um, but many of them are delightful, and they paint a a wonderfully complex picture of the society that's sitting underneath the persistent universe that the developers are building right now. So you should check those out. They're on the RobertSpaceIndustries.com website. And, uh, and the easiest way to get to them, well, let me just jump in, is yeah. if you go to the the com link, and then uh, the the top uh, drop down on the left is called channel. And if you go to Spectrum Dispatch, uh, so if you uh, think about this as a dispatch going out on the Spectrum, that's that's where the repository of all these live. Um, like I said, going back years and years and years. So, and, and they do have things where they can be like like Jared said, really quick, you know, one offs, or as mentioned earlier, you know, like a longer a longer story that Jeremy wrote called Crossroads, or we have a few stories like that 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 fill in some other things too. So, to easy way to kind of like start diving into things and then if you have any certain topics or you could type in banu or xian and just see what pops up and then kind of go through and see where where they're where they're referenced in any of these stories yeah and we have the jump points as well which always have interesting narrative elements kind of tied into the portfolios about the companies i think older portfolios do get post the spectrum but if you want to keep up kind of live there's always interesting things to read there i think the development of new lore it's something that i faced like one you know over this last my first year here which everyone's always really interested in you know creating and coming up with more we're definitely doing it in service of a broader vision for the game and like when there are development needs that lore can kind of answer questions to inform choices along the way i think if we go too far and just you know make up lore for anything and everything without any connection to the rest of the game then we start constraining what's possible with that vision when ultimately we're trying to be in service to the players and to the game and to creating a kind of cohesive vision for for what Star Citizen can be and can be understood by by both the players and the developers because you know we, we we've all read the like deep hundred page you know plus documents that we have for all the various like little parts I mean you know niche parts of the game. I think we don't really expect that of anyone else, but that information is there for people who are passionate and interested about it. And as a follow-up to that, will the alien lore narrative, all this stuff that we've been talking about, uh, be explorable or learnable eventually in the game, either through missions, data finds, libraries, etc.? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, again, the, the, the idea is that this stuff is not isn't meant to exist as uh you know i need to do a deep dive on a on a website like we want to be int introducing this stuff throughout in as storylines in the game as part of the environments um you know things that you can find uh missions characters all that stuff so uh, yeah the, the hope is that um that yeah it's going to start trickling its way into the game as the aliens start to become an actual presence in the game that you'll be able to learn about this stuff and Anyways. Uh, we got some Vandal questions here towards the end here. Uh, do the Vandals have a deeply developed lore in the verse? When you were speaking to them earlier, you said, we don't know this, we don't know that. You were speaking about humanity in our game's knowledge Correct. of them. But uh, how much do you know about the Vandal at this point? A lot. Uh, a lot. I mean, you saw how Sherry just took a little bit of time and was able to, go, you know, search FanDuel poop and had an answer for you. So we, yeah. There, there may or may not be a 200 page document. I don't know. <laughs> All right. So, so, so while it is still uh, up to humanity to discover uh, much about them, you guys are, are you guys have a, it's a supposedly a 200 page document. I'd like to see that document, please. Allegedly. Allegedly. Uh, what is the god 
or creation history of Vandal? Would you like to reveal that on a random Alien Week stream? No. They, they have one. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> okay. Um, if we could have alien pets, cough, lizard doggo. I should read these before I start reading them. Uh, what ideas do you have to build a narrative around them? I mean, we do have, we have come up with at least one pet. Um, back, harking back to the uh, animal naming contest, we had the uh, Yao Yao. It's a little cat otter type thing that is domesticated by the Xi'an a long time ago as a method of pest control. But, you know, they have modern tech now and they don't really need it for pest control anymore. So it's just like this adorable little creature that sits in their house and watches everybody. They go, oh my God, it's so cute. So we at least have one of those. And um, I mean, well, there's the famous flat cat. Oh, and the flat cat, of course. Flat cats are pets, um, although they're a little hard to get because they're, they're sourced from a planet that's protected by the Fair Chance Act. So you're not going to see those around. And we got lots of, of course, we, we remember the fish, the fish, we got fish. Um, and the turtles, Leyland's tortoise. You remember that? Yeah. yeah. And that was really fun. I, I count that as a pet. But uh, yeah, for like um, stories in the game or like missions, I'm sure that, I mean, just off the top of my head, we could do like a lost pet mission to find any, any one of these little creatures and make their owners very happy when you give them back or conversely, maybe keep it to your, for yourself, run away with the adorable pet. <laughs> but that's just an idea. I'm just spitballing. Um, while the well, arc of the, go ahead. I mean, I think also the question of like alien creatures for me always makes me think of the space walls, right? Like the big space whales and, or and Orson, right? They're not really human creatures, like human pets necessarily. But I think there's, I've always been interested in like, what's the poaching narrative around that, right? They're protected. I could easily see like the kind of combat missions that we have already featuring that sort of narrative approach. Um, so this next question. Oh, wait, sorry. I almost forgot about flow pets, which were a huge pet craze. It's like some kind of freshwater sea slug. Um, but they're considered invasive now because of how quickly they enter sewers in whatever settlement they're on, breed and take over the whole thing. So another fun thing you could probably do in game is go on a flow pet extermination mission. <laughs> I want to see that. Yeah, like the that would be fun. Plague. Yeah, the I would really plague enjoy in the public. The views and opinions expressed by Sherry Heiberg do not represent those of Cloud Imperium Games, Robert Space Industries, or its subsidiaries. <laughs> um, let's follow up on this next question that's here in the list actually touches on uh, something Jeremy was talking about earlier about not wanting to just develop lore for lore's sake and, and paint uh, uh, developers in the corners stuff. Uh, this question has to do with the star map and uh, addressing various changes that have happened over the years. Um, how does that, how does that work? How, how, how does that, is when you develop something, do the, are, are the developers, is a designer on EU Sandbox 2 locked into only working with what's been, you know, written and, and shared before? Or, do, or, or is there room for you to change what's been established through previous stories or previous uh, databank entries in order to you know, help somebody create a mission or a location that they're working on? Uh, no, they're absolutely rigid bound, have to adhere to every word that we write. Um, Narrative is king. Uh, yes. Uh, no, no, no. It's, I mean, again, the, the important thing to bear in mind, like, particularly with like the, the, the systems and the star map stuff, like, you know, a lot of the, these systems were conceived of a, a while ago, back when we didn't necessarily, I mean, this is actually, a lot of the systems were even built when we didn't know that we could actually do a planetary landing. Like right. the idea, the original idea was that it was a much more like you had landing zones and stuff like that in this sort of, you know, there could be like little action bubbles that you could land at. But the idea was that, you know, it's like space was the, the, the playground, the planets were like, had landings designated landing zones that you could land at and uh now that once the technology has allowed us to realize you know the entire planet at a incredible level of fidelity uh you know we've been changing our approach to stuff because now it's like we need you know we want to have gameplay that that keeps players on planets and lets them explore and do all sorts of really cool stuff um so you know 
when we were coming up with a lot of these systems originally, it was sort of, A, it was based off of that idea that it was like, we're not going to be able to explore these planets, so keep it very simple or single biome uh, type uh, type places. Um, and now that we're able to expand it, like, you know, you know, it's much more fun and satisfying for people to be able to explore these things. So we're modifying it kind of as we go. I mean, we're doing our what we can to try to minimize the retconning. So it's not like, you know, this was a hellscape nightmare world of acid and now it's like you know unicorn central like <laughs> so it requires a, a complete rewriting of your understanding of like what that planet was so we're we're doing what we can to, to try to minimize it but there is definitely going to be that kind of like and again as we've been looking at pyro like there's been a sort of push to kind of shift some of the the the, the atmospheric uh compositions to make right. you know them slightly more breathable but maybe not toxic you know that type of stuff because it's it's more conducive to creating a better gameplay experience so we always want to try to we, we've historically always tried to be very cryptic as where possible about stuff like specific but cryptic uh but just to give people the opportunity the other designers and environment teams and artists and gameplay people to you know to have their the own game. agency, yeah, to, exactly, and know. feel like they can make the most fun experience, and then we can kind of help support that. Uh, yeah. yeah, nobody nobody wants to join a project, you know, years into development, and every 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 answer is there. Everything's been figured out. It's just, it's just a laundry list of things to do, and they they can't bring their own creativity. They can't bring their own ingenuity uh, to things, uh, and that's one that's one of the reasons you know I'm always saying this is game development, not game construction. It's not just a set plan that was there from you know the beginning, and everybody's just building A, B, C, D, and E. It's a, every single person that that uh, joins the project project hopefully brings their own agency, their own creativity, their own ingenuity to things and new ideas and new ways to do things and they can be incorporated to making the project better than it would have been without them in an ideal world. Uh, you know, Mike and Shella notwithstanding. Hi, Mike. Um, just unnecessary shade at Mike. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> that's because I said the nice thing to him earlier about the thing, so I had to balance it. Um, do some Banu hate human merchantmen owners? Only if they're really bad at parking. Uh, and uh, last question here. Uh, chat saying I haven't proved it's live. I don't have to prove it's live. Um, you want like a newspaper? <laughs> Uh, uh, should I should I get a uh, like an index card and write here, we are live? Here, on no, and here, to no, <laughs> here, here. I know it will do. Uh, 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 Tom, do you have the? Do, you, do, you, do we still have the Zoom? Do we still have the Zoom? Uh, God, I hope so. Now, did we break it? Break. Okay, there we go. Look, Elwin, you remember ISC yesterday? Yeah, we're gonna wrap. This is this is wrapping up the show. This is the end of the show. Uh, Elwin just sent me uh, a look at at the latest uh, 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 dash for the uh, uh, for the um, the Santoc Yai. Uh, that they're working on right now. So look at that. You can freeze frame that and look at that. So that's how I know it's live. Because you just sent it to me. And you saw the Twitch chat there. So yeah. Uh, that's it. Thanks for hanging out, everybody. Dave, Adam, Sherry, Jeremy. It's always a pleasure to have you on. We don't get to hang out nearly as much as, as, we, as we used to because I'm over here now where it's so hot. So far and, from us. I know. I know. Do you guys, do you guys still go to Honey's Kettle? We haven't been in a while, um, but yeah, we should probably do a... Please, 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 please get some biscuits. Yeah, let's do a chicken run. Do a chicken run for me. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for hanging out. Uh, remember, Alien Week is going on. There's all kinds of contests and stuff uh, uh, currently underway. You can check out the RobertSpaceIndustries.com website and socials for that. Also, if you haven't noticed, uh, they also posted the information about CitizenCon uh, 2953 this year. Uh, it is a two-day event at the Los Angeles Convention Center. Uh, you can check out the information about that on robertspaceindustries.com website, including when tickets are available, stuff like that. Uh, don't worry, if you can not attend, we'll still be broadcasting it uh, on our Twitch channel like we do every year. Uh, but uh, it, it's we haven't done one of these things live and in person in four years. And uh, I highly encourage you, if you have the means, it's within your means and your budget and your capabilities to attend. Uh, they are always a blast. And two days can only be like I can't, I can't even wrap my head around. I just found out it's two days, and I can't wrap my head around that how we're gonna fill that up. So yeah, 
so thanks for hanging out. Uh, I'm Jared again. That was Dave and Adam and uh, Jeremy and Sherry. Uh, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week, everybody. Take care.